in March of 2016, my wife and I went on vacation to Iceland. It was a fascinating small island with the friendly people who spoke English. This is a view out the window of our motel, and you can see the snow, and it's definitely got icy and snowy areas. Here we are in front of a waterfall and another type of waterfall. It was fascinating where they had horses who stood out there in the snow and the breeze, wind, and uh, didn't seem to be cold at all. There was a ancient uh, Viking type of huts that were rock with covered with uh, grass and straw, and they were quite warm and very rustic. Of course, we had to be the tourists and take our pictures like a Viking in Viking outfits. <laughs> Here we are with our uh, Northern Lights picture, and we had a, an exceptionally good time. Iceland is a small country about the size of Louisiana. There are around 3,000, 300,000 people in the whole country, most living near the capital of Reykjavik. That is about equal to half the population of Fort Worth. Iceland was founded in the 1800s by the Vikings, so the history of Iceland is basically the history of the Vikings. There was a medieval warm period in the temperatures of northern hemisphere between 900 and 1250. This allowed the Vikings to sail and establish colonies in places that otherwise would be too cold. They sailed into the area of Reykjavik and established a settlement. The Vikings sailed all over Europe from North Africa to Russia to Turkey to North America. Here you can see where they had settlements in the orange areas, and the areas that they raided are in dark blue. They raided places for weapons, clothing, slaves. Where you see settlements, the Vikings actually assimilated into the local population, except in Iceland and Greenland where they were founding new towns in countries with almost no inhabitants. The Vikings actually founded some major cities, for example, Dublin, Wexford, Waterford, Cork, and Limerick in Ireland. They settled most of York area of England, and they started several towns in Russia, Somlesk and Novogorod. The Vikings actually did not wear helmets with horns. That's a Hollywood fabrication to make them look meaner. They actually had helmets without horns. Though most of the Viking lands, they traded for goods. In Iceland, they traded fish, animal fat, wool, cloth, and clothing, sulfur, and falcons. And you can see these other establishments. They had other items that they traded. Um, obviously in the Middle East they traded for silks which the uh, Vikings did not have. Most of our knowledge of the Viking area clothing and textiles comes from the archaeological findings in grave sites while some comes from literary sources and written law. The Norse people used worn-out clothing for many purposes. Sometimes it was coated with pitch and used to seal cracks in the shipbuilding process. In other cases, fabric was coated with pitch and used as torches. These pitch-coated fabrics have survived very well. One, at least, entire garment was survived from the Viking era because someone used it in the process of building a ship. Here's an example of the sagas in Iceland. They recorded a great deal of the history of the Viking ages in the 9th, 10th, and 11th centuries. They are focused on history, especially genealogical and family history as well. They reflect the struggle and the conflict that arose within the societies of the early generations of Icelandic settlers.
Eventually, many of the Icelandic sagas were recorded mostly in the 13th and 14th centuries and written down in these books. Clothing styles were remarkably consistent throughout most of the Viking lands. Men wore a tunic that was tight-fitting across the chest with a broad skirt. Down below were trousers which could be either loose-fitting or tight. The outer garment for the man's upper body was the, called the kirtil, the overturnic. It was constructed from wool and was constructed using surprisingly complicated patterns with many pieces that needed to be cut out of the fabric and sewn back together. However, when it was all laid out, very little fabric went to waste. This photo shows the individual pieces of fabric being fitted together to make a tunic. The upper part of the garment is relatively tight-fitting, but the sleeves are fitted to provide freedom of motion. The men's skirt ranged from thigh length to knee length. As with most articles of clothing, the length was determined by the wealth of the owner. A poorer man would not waste material that wasn't needed while a more wealthy man would show off his wealth by using more material. The tunic was pulled over the head. There were usually no fasteners, although some tunics had a simple button and loop thread to fasten the opening. A keyhole necktie was the most common, although many other shapes were used for the neck opening for men and women. Tunics of all but the poorest people were decorated with braid, at least on the neckline and cuffs. The tunics of the more wealthy were also decorated. With braid on the hem of the skirt, the braid was woven with brightly colored wood using tablet weaving. Here are some tablets that were uncovered from grave sites. The tablets had several different designs of holes. Here are some examples of fabric from tablet weaving from then. Here's a, re recre a recreation of pattern of one strip of cloth. These strips were used to trim the edges of clothing as well as straps for hanging items. They also could be used as belts. Imported silk was also used to trim a tunic, although expensive, and only the wealthiest people used them. Silk was taken from voyages to the Middle East. Under the tunic, it's likely that most men wore an under tunic. This was made mostly from linen. It was more expensive than wool, but more comfortable against the skin and was an extra layer of warmth. The construction was similar to that of the over tunic, except that the sleeves and the skirt were made longer. It appears that a wide range of styles for tra trousers were used in the Norse lands. Some were tight and some were baggy. Most trousers were of simple construction, but some had been more complicated. Trousers had no pockets and no fly. The lack of pockets in any Viking area clothing meant that the men and women had to carry their everyday items suspended from belt or from pouches, carried around the neck, or suspended from brooches. It is possible that some trousers were held up by a simple drawstring and a waistband as seen in this reproduction trousers shown here. Yet many surviving examples of trousers have belt loops suggesting that trousers were held up with a belt or sash. Some means of holding up the trousers is required since there was no opening at the waist. The waistband must be big enough to pass over the hips. They wore leg wrappings from knee to foot. The wrappings consisted of two long, narrow strips of cloth, typically wool, which were round around the leg and foot. By starting at the knee and wrapping downward and ending at the toes, no clips or fasteners were needed. The fabric would have been woven to the correct dimensions of the intended purpose rather than cut from a larger piece of cloth. Having selvages along each edge would resist fraying. Both men and women wore outer cloaks, the cloak was simply a large rectangular piece of wool, sometimes lined with contrasting color wool. Cloaks provided extra protection from the cold, from the wind, 
and to a limited degree the rain. Some cloaks were made with very dense, very thick wool, which would have been provided extra protection. Cloaks were typically worn offset with the right arm, the weapon arm, unencumbered by the cloak. They could be embroidered or trimmed with tablet woven braids. Typically they hung to somewhere between the knee and the ankle, depending on the wealth of the owner. Some cloaks had a shaggy exterior like a sheepskin. The shaggy appearance was created by tying additional threads to the warm threads while the fabric was being woven. Some think tufts from the fleece of the sheep were looped around the warp threads, but not pulled tight, leaving a large loop. This resulting garment resembled a patchy lamb fleece, a modern construction of the shaggy coat as displayed here. Cloaks were held in place by a pin at the right shoulder. The pins ranged from iron, bronze, wood, antler bones, uh, or even elaborate gold jewelry. A common style was the pin annular brooch. Like all Norse jewelry, the brooch typically would have been highly decorated. Caps were made of wool or sheepskin or leather and fur. Some, some had ear flaps for warmth. They were made with four or more triangular pieces sewn together. A modern replica of a cap made in this manner is shown here. So socks apparently were optional depending on the wealth of the individual or the season of the year. Those without the means for socks used moss or grasses or even hay to line their shoes. When socks were available, they were made of undyed wool. The Norse socks were not knitted. Instead, they were made using an ancient technique called now binding. Using a single large thick needle, it was a method of knotting the yarn. A thread should break, then the garment would be less likely to unravel. This is a demonstration of that. Shoes were typically were simple affairs made using the turn shoe technique. The uppers were sewn to the sole with the finished side inside and then the rough side out. Then the shoes were turned inside out. The women's clothing, in general, it was made from the same materials as the men's. Typically, a woman wore an ankle-length linen underdress or shift with the neck closed by a brooch. Over it, she wore a shorter-length woolen dress suspended by shoulder straps fastened by brooches. This kind of suspended dress is sometimes called a hanger rock or an apron skirt. Several different styles of Viking age. In modern times, these brooches are sometimes called turtle brooches, since their shape is similar to the shell of the turtle. There's also evidence of for some overdress, which completely covered shoulders and requiring no brooches to hold it in place. The women would wear an ankle-length coat-like outer garment over her suspended dress, but cloaks or shawls all were also used and were probably more common. There's a modern replica of one here. Women often use tri-lobed brooches to fasten the neck opening of their clothing. These skeletal remains of a Viking Age woman clearly shows her tri-lobed brooch in place where it fastened the neck opening of her burial clothes. Head coverings were typically worn by women, perhaps as simple as a knotted neckerchief over the head which was found at several burial sites. A number of different kinds of head coverings for women are mentioned in the sagas, some of which were very elaborate headdresses, which may have been worn like jewelry on special occasions. All of the steps in making a set of clothing, from processing the fibers to spinning, weaving, cutting, sewing, were done by the women of the family. Since the process was so labor-intensive, a set of clothing was highly prized and carefully maintained. And since the work was skilled, the women doing this work were an indispensable part of the household. Wool from the sheep, which were raised throughout all of the Norse lands, not only for wool but for food, 
Limited flax was ground to get linen. They made crude cutting device to shear the sheep. The fleece then was cleaned to eliminate dirt and debris and then combed with iron tooth combs to smooth and disentangle the fibers making ready for spinning. Wool was spun into yarn by a drop spindle. Spindle whirls are common archaeological finds. Different sized spindle whirls were used for making different weight threads. The wood shaft of the spindle was whittled or a crude lathe was made using a bow to turn the wood. The drop spindle was used in Iceland all the way until the early 1800s. The dyeing process could be applied to the fleece, to the thread, or to the finished fabric. The dyes available to Norse weavers were limited, but many of them were very bright colors. A variety of vegetable dyes were commonly used, resulting in a range of colors, browns, reds, yellow, blue. This Icelandic sagas were often mentioned clothing colors. Brightly colored clothing was a symbol of wealth and power, no doubt due to the additional expense of dye stuffs and the multiple dyeing operations required to make bright colors. Frequently linen undergarments were left undyed, in part because linen is difficult to dye. The looms used by Viking Age weavers would have allowed them to make a wide variety of plaids, checks, stripes, other patterns, but for whatever reason they chose not to. Few examples of these pattern fabrics are found in the archaeological records. When patterns were woven into the fabric, Viking weavers more commonly used fine patterns with one or two threads of a single contrasting color thread spaced in the weave, as shown here. Fabric was woven on a vertical loom. The modern reproduction is shown here. Typical looms from the period were capable of weaving material as wide as 65 inches. These looms were used in Iceland until almost the 1900. The warp threads were tensioned by means of stones tied to the threads at the bottom. The warp threads were moved relative to one another using the heddle rods. Each warp thread had a loop of thread around it tied to one of the several heddle rods. Thus, by moving the heddle rods forwards and backwards relative to the warp, a shed was created. Each pass of the weft thread, a wooden beater was used to push the new weft up against the fabric above. Other materials were used as beaters, including broken sword components. This historical beater shown is a wooden portion of a pattern welded sword blade fitted with a wooden hilt having a wooden cross guard and pommel. The start of the cloth at the top would not be twill to support the weight of the hanging cloth. It was usually plain weave. The warp was always tightly spun to be able to carry the weights which held it tense. In all the fabrics, these threads are right spun. The horizontal weft threads would be either right or left spun, but it was quite often thicker and looser and of finer wool than the warp. One of the sheds was the natural shed created by itself because of the tension of the warp weights. Because of this, Warping system, what we call a two-shed fabric, is in the old terms known as a one-shed plus a natural shed. A four-shed fabric would be known as three sheds plus the natural shed. The two-shed plain weave is the simplest and oldest of the basic weaves, and in Viking age they're quite abundant. Twill is another of the basic weaves, 2-2 two -two twill or so-called diagonal twill, the finest have been between 35 and 70 threads per inch in the tightest systems and between 20 and 50 threads per inch 
and more coarse cloth. There are many selvages preserved, and they were plain or tubular woven, and can appear like a fine hem. The tubular selvages were created by the bringing the weft back over and skipping a certain number of warp threads. A large group of cloth found had cross twill weaving. There are 20 threads per inch. The warp in these blankets is very thin and tight right spun. The thread of the weft is quite thick and is left spun for finer wool about 12 threads per inch. In this manner, the weave produced a very soft and airy blanket. Diamond twill were found in several graves from that era. All these diamond twill fabrics had right spun yarn in both systems. The type was given the name Burka type as it appears in more than 40 graves in the Viking village trading town of Burka. The herringbone twill was also found in garments. Slingviv is the name of a weave where two or more warp threads wind themselves around each other and are adjusted in the shed. Garments were sewn together using needles made of bone, wood, antlers, and metal. Larger needles were typically made from organic materials, but smaller, finer needles were made of iron or copper alloy. The small size of the needles and their eyes suggest that fine thread was used for stitching, consistent with some of the fine weaves found in finished fabrics from the Viking Age. Needles were often stored in needle cases made of bone, iron, or copper alloy. These cases were common finds in the graves of women and were suspended from the brooches worn by the women. When hanging, these cases kept the needles safe and secure, yet it was easily opened to reveal the needles inside when needed. A variety of seams and stitches were used, including the finished stitch. Some of these seams were finished on both sides. Embroidery was also used to decorate clothing. The modern reproductions of a cap and a hood are, are decorated with embroidery around the edge, as example here. Norse-era garments were probably finer, better proportioned, better designed, and more brightly colored, and better suited for their purpose than one might ordinarily imagine. The materials that have survived are much finer than one might expect given their time in history. Samples of fabric with over 125 threads per inch have been found. Hand stitching was fine as modern machine stitching seems to be, have been the norm. Norse people probably expected their clothing to last for years without much attention. Norse people probably had only a few sets of clothing that, and they were expected to last for years. The value of a set of clothing can be put into perspective in considering the work and time to produce it. Clothing was desirable booty in a Viking raid, along with precious metals and weapons, further emphasizing the value of the clothing in the Viking era. Sails on ships were mostly made of wool. Meter upon meter of fabric was painstakingly woven in strips and sewn together. Outfitting a single warship and its crew might have required the wool of a thousand sheep or more. It took land and farming skills to raise the sheep that supplied the wool, and a support network of women whose spindles and looms produced the cloth. The demand for pasture land might have driven the Viking expansion as much as the gleaming temptations for stolen treasure. The sheep are double-coated with an outer coat of long, strong guard hairs and a soft, warm inner coat. Both kinds of fiber showed up into the old sails. To create a strong fabric, the weaver used the coarse outer hairs in the sail's warp. The weft came from the soft inner coat that fluffs out a bit, filling the gaps in the weave. The finished material was then fulled 
that is treated to shrink it slightly and tighten the fabric. Creating a woolen sail involved applying a resinous goo. This was a combination of tree, fur, tar, fish oil, and sleep tallow. It made sails repel water and have a substantial wind resistance. By the mid-11th century, the Viking fleets, fishing boats, coastal traders, cargo ships, and long ships carried roughly one million square meters of sail, requiring the equivalent of all the wool produced in one year by about two million sheep. So this trip through history of the Vikings is basically a story of Iceland from 1870 to the 1700s. It was settled by the Vikings, and most are descendants of the Vikings. My wife and I also toured a museum in Iceland in a replica of a Viking hut, as you can see with the grass. Here's a, a example of from the 1800s of some weaving equipment there. This is a spindle and some spools of, that would contain the yarn. Here are some other spools and their carriers. And usually a little drawer below, probably housing some threads and uh, needles. Here's another group of them. They're rather old and, and antique looking, and I thought quite cute. Here's a group of spindles and the stones that are used for those spindles. This is a large group of items. There's some bones that would contain the threads, as well as some flat uh, boats. They had their wheels with the yarn as well as spinning wheels, quite a few of them in this museum. This is an example of some hand-spun garment threads. The material is quite intricate. If we zoom in on it, you can see the overshot patterns. thought that was quite interesting. Here's a tapestry that was hanging on the wall. And this is a tapestry type material that was put over the seats. And these are side saddles for f ladies. They were then later on turned into chairs. Here's another example of some tapestry work. Here's some gloves, and belts, pouches, examples of some weaving. And here's three ladies' outfits. If we zoom in on some of these, the material and the weaving are quite interesting from the 1800s. A lot of delicate scroll work. And here's another tapestry, a man and a woman, and some spools of thread below it. Here's another example of some tapestry. And one more tapestry. Here's some burlap sacks that had been hand woven and they decorated them with some stripes. These are rather intricate patterns. It looks like a twill of some kind. Here's some tattered work. There's quite a few lacy tattings that have been around the museum. Here's two chairs and some dolly tatting work in the middle. The chairs had some inlay done. Then there was three sewing kits that were on the table. This chair 
some nice tapestry work and some needlework. Here are three really old chairs. I thought were kind of cute. They were carved as well as it had some uh, woven material on the seats. This is another cloth that was on the table. Another woven material on the seats. A lot of overshot. And here's some tablet weaving. Another example of some tablet weaving. They had some cloth that it was rather interesting uh, and unique materials. We then moved to the more modern time. And these were stores that were now current in Iceland. You can see some of the cloths and blankets that, that were both hand-woven as well as probably some machine-woven ones. I thought this was interesting where the, they were handmade by Icelanders. You can see the different dolls and characters that they were selling. Here is also, of course, some Viking ships for the tourists. But if you notice, the helmets have no horns. Here's some more material, which was hand-woven. As we zoom in, you can see the pattern and twill work. Here's a sweater. I'm not too sure if this wasn't machine-made. I just thought it was really pretty. And here's some hand-woven uh, materials and carpets. And here's some more. There was quite a few um, hand-woven cloth. They had a very interesting design, kind of almost like triangles, but they were offset. I thought this was rather unique. Here's a whole rack of the same patterns. Here's another blanket. This was a rather interesting blanket because the hash marks go left and right and left and right on this. Same as this. This was a rather interesting weaving. Seems like it had rows of almost like square blocks or boxes created by the overshots with a long one and two short ones, a long one, two short ones. And here's another row of blankets that were woven. One in particular I thought was quite interesting if we zoom in on this one pattern, quite unique and very pretty. I'm not too sure how they did that. There is an Icelandic texture center, and that textile center is uh, hard to access in the winter. And you can see where our hotel was near Reykjavik, but. It was uh, up near another town far north and pretty much almost impassable in the winter. Uh, you'd have to have a pretty uh, sturdy vehicles to get there. So we were unable to make the trip up to it. This is a picture of the facilities and you can see the mountains, very picturesque. They have a, quite a bit of looms in this facility. This is a picture of some of them. And you can see some of their work in this 
spinning wheel there. They have a quite large area, especially for sewing and some somewhat dyeing of the cloth. There's a spinning wheel. And these ladies are more picture of a more modern dresses that were made in the old style. There were, you can see the cloth and the purses that hang from the belts. We had a good time in Iceland. Wish I could have seen more.